can't work. I'm the BLM. I have a stop work order. I'm not allowed to do anything. I'm supposed to remove my possessions from this mine, close up this mine, reclaim the surface, and leave before I even get a hearing. And the BLM is trying to bully me and force me off my land at the risks of totally violating my Fourth and Fifth Amendment rights, and I refuse to budge. I am not leaving. They are not taking me out of here until I get my day in court. This is a constitutional republic. We're a nation of laws, and that includes the federal agencies. So how long has this mine, the Sugar Pine Mine, been in existence? The Sugar Pine Mine was found uh, first filed on in 1858. So it's my, been in continuous operation since then? Yes. My claim dates from when Daniel Green bought it from Devil Biss and his partner in 1876. So how did this come to be? How did you get the Oath Keepers in here? How did that happen? A BLM officer, of a uh, law enforcement officer who I do not know his name, and contract deputy Stanton came in on Monday last week. I don't remember the date. They came in obstinately to serve George papers, which we've already been served. So they came in, as far as I'm concerned, to see if we were had moved out so they could start burning stuff. Let's just call it what it is. And when, uh, when you say burning stuff, what do you mean burning stuff? They burn cabins. They burn hundreds. Hundreds of cabins in this country since the 70s. So within the Siskiyou mountain range here, BLM has a history of burning cabins. Repeatedly. And what's they, the burned one, they burned one on these set of claims in the 80s on the Golden Cycle over there. Oh, so they burned one, a cabin close by. On my group of claims, yes. Oh, so they have a history of coming in and burning cabins with no notice. Uh, yes. Okay, so... so as you said, so what was your concern about their notice of them showing up here? When the officers went to leave, the first thing they did is they came up to Danny, who's a caretaker, and said, oh, this is the guy we're having a problem with. And then when they were getting ready to leave, George says, look, we're law-abiding constitutional people. And Deputy Stanton turned to him and says, well, I have a problem with the Constitution. And at that moment, I realized that the agencies that I rely on to protect my rights weren't going to protect my rights. So I went to the Oath Keepers because that's what they say they'll do. So with that, what happened with bringing the Oath Keepers in here? Uh, the, uh, the government has become a little more amenable to my request. They have actually sent me two FOIAs now, but no, not much. They're, they still are unhappy and they're in contact with my attorney and telling him that they're, this is not proper. How did they first make contact with you to let you know that they wanted you to take these actions? They gave you a cease and desist. How, how was that contacted? They sent that certified return receipt mail. So you got a certified return receipt mail. You acknowledged the receipt of service. Yeah. And then they still showed up on the property? Uh, twice. Twice? Twice. Okay. Yeah. And now, if I understand, what did the cease and desist order ask for? Um, the cease and desist, there's two different orders. There are two pages each. The, this first one was the BLM observed the presence of mechanized earth moving equipment, a small bulldozer and a mini excavator, which had been recently used to bury and install a water pipe system, improve roads, clear added interest, and level areas for structures and work areas. That's the first one. Now, isn't that type of activity allowed on a mine? Uh, yes. Is That's, that normal activity for a mine? That is normal activity for a load mine. Yes, so having mining equipment on a mine site's normal? Well, it's kind of like finding a tractor on a farm. I know that they might be amazed that we actually have mining equipment here, but it is a mine, and we are mining. We're not running a hippie commune. We're not growing dope. We don't have a junkyard. We are mining. And the other um, notice 
The BLM observed two camp trailers and a watchman on site. Also present were two non-BLM gates, multiple no trespassing signs and warning signs claiming exclusive surface use, a recently constructed cabin, a milling facility placed on a recently poured concrete slab, several small crushers, small ball mill, a small saw mill, storage of equipment, small bulldozer, mini excavator, two ATVs, several trailers, and storage of supplies, fuel tank, lumber, various supplies, and tools. So if I understand what they're saying there, is that they're describing the support equipment you use to operate the mine. Yes. Is that allowed to be here? Under the Surface uh, Act? They don't think so, but I'm not working under the aegis of the Surface Act. I'm working under the 1872 laws that say I have exclusive use and possession of the surface. So under the 1872 Mining Act, this is normal operation? This is normal, allowable. There's there's volumes of case law that's been done on this kind of particular question. In the courts, I have a book by Terry S. Maley, who's a law professor that specializes in this. He was high in the BLM. He was the head of the Idaho Department of Minerals. The man's very well versed. I, have, I can cite case law um, and reference individual cases that have to do with this and establish a case law precedence for what I'm saying. So... As I look at this mine, and that looks to be maybe a five-foot culvert. It is. This wouldn't appear to be surface. It seems to be, I mean, how deep does that go in the hillside? 1,100 feet. So you're basically picking ore out of that mine tunnel. Yes. And you're taking it down to the site. Right. And then you're milling it on the site and processing your ore. That's correct. Which is a normal mine operation. Yes, sir. And the cabin and the trailer is to, for what purpose? George stays in the cabin when he's up here, and Danny stays here to keep watch because there's no law enforcement in Josephine County, and everything that you leave in the woods is fair game. So, so basically, when you're running mine operations, if I understand correctly, the cabin is to support you while you're up here working on the mine, which is allowed. Yes. And the RV or the trailer that's down there Danny's staying in is also to support when he's working on the mine and as a watchman to protect your investment in equipment. Danny doesn't work at the mine. We allow Danny to stay up here and he can prospect around. He mines all over the place. In exchange, he keeps an eye on the place when we're not around. So you, you have a substantial investment in your mining equipment? Yes, sir. Okay. And you want that protected? I do want that protected. So when you brought the Oath Keepers in, I understand you went to their monthly meeting and you made a request. That's right. What was that request? That we have our constitutional rights, the Fourth and Fifth Amendment, to redress and due process and prevention of illegal search and seizure until I get my day in court. So basically, if I understand, BLM did not give you the opportunity for Fifth Amendment due process, the constitutionally protected right, they wanted you and all the equipment off this claim on the 25th of April. Yes, sir. When's your court date scheduled? I haven't got a court date yet. So they were penalizing you prior to your constitutional right to due process. That's right. So you invited the Oath Keepers in here to do what? To maintain my right to due process. So they came on site. And they have basically, I understand their reasoning here, is they are securing your mining claim to ensure BLM doesn't come on to it and violate your Fourth Amendment and Fifth Amendment due process right That's and right. to protect your cabin from being burned and, and the seizure of your equipment. The way the BLM traditionally works is they will burn the cabin, have a contractor remove your equipment, and even if you subsequently prevail in court, you still spend several years trying to get your equipment back, and then you're out all the time and effort that it's taken for you to regain your lawful possessions. Has, is there a legal tactic of play where if you pull all the equipment off of this, they could claim that the mine was abandoned and therefore it would fall under the 1955 Act? No, they can't do that because we've done our, we have our assessment current and so they can't say the mine is abandoned because we do the yearly uh, paperwork and you have to do a certain amount of work. It is interesting that they tell me I can't use equipment, I can't do anything up here, but by law 
I'm required to do a certain amount of labor per year to maintain my possession of my claim. So you need to maintain the claim, but they're telling you you can't do that. That's correct. I can come up here with a gold pan, I suppose. They're, they'll allow me to have a gold pan, maybe pan a little bit in the creek as long as I don't disturb any fish or something. But there's no fish in that creek, but nonetheless. So basically they're putting me in an untenable position. So I, I understand Oath Keepers came in, they secured the mine site. So there was a site survey done on a Saturday, and it was understood during that site survey that you had a deadline coming up on that coming Tuesday, the cabin had to be off the claim. That's correct. I had 14 days from receipt of notice to remove the dwelling. So at that point you requested a security operation and Oath Keepers stood up and they brought in other resources from around the state of Oregon and actually around the, the nation, correct? That's correct. So we've got, currently on site, we've got the 3% group, Oath Keepers, all of them have been supporting the operation? That's correct. Have you had any concerns about the way they've been running the operation, the security operation? No, sir. You have any concerns that they need to be leave or you want them here? They came at my request. I requested their presence. I still request their presence until such time as I achieve my due process. They can stay here and see to it that justice is served. So as we move forward with the security operation, uh, Oath Keepers, the three percenters, they will remain and secure your claim. They will protect your Fourth Amendment, Fifth Amendment constitutional rights, and they're here to ensure that the BLM, the government, do not violate that. Is that correct? That is correct. That is the sum total of their purpose to be here is to protect my rights, to due process, and to preserve, preserve my property until such time as I get a, my day in court. So currently this is not a standoff? No. This is not a standoff. This is simply a protective measure to prevent the BLM from further violating my rights and destroying my property without due process. So you would describe this as a security operation to protect your constitutional rights? That's correct. We've not, there has not been any confrontation with BLM? No, there has been no confrontation. There has been no uh, implied threat, overt threats or any such thing. All correspondence with the BLM has been held through my attorney. George and I have no contact with the BLM. We'll let the attorney deal with them. Do you we, believe the reason BLM did not come in was because of the Oath Keeper President and Three Percenter presence? I'm absolutely positive that the BLM hasn't destroyed my property because it has been protected as have been my rights by a group of folks. Do you feel that the way they're handling themselves, how would you describe their professionalism and everything they're doing up here on the security and at the staging area? They have done everything that they said they would do. I have no problems. Their administration of their security detail is theirs. I have no, no management authority over them other than requesting them to be here. They've conducted themselves well and professionally.